Welcome to Perspectives. I'm Setare Derakhshesh. Arab Spring was the hopeful name given to last year's popular uprisings in the Middle East, demanding democratization in countries run by dictators. After Tunisia, Egypt became the second country to topple its government relatively peacefully. Libya followed suit, but the transition was violent when the Gaddafi regime refused to yield power. Now, a year later, we are witnessing a similarly unstable situation in Syria that shows no sign of abating and threatens the entire region. In this edition of Perspectives, we take a close look at where Egypt's revolt stands a year after masses of Egyptians celebrated the ouster of Hosni Mubarak. The mood has changed. People are frustrated. Many complain that the transition is a sham. We will hear the perspectives of opposition politician Ayman Noor, and author Ashraf Khalil. We have Mona El Tahawi, a writer who was assaulted by security forces in Cairo, and U.S. Senator Patrick Leahy on what leverage the United States has to influence developments in Egypt. First, we start with a glimpse at how some of the Arab Spring countries are faring a year later. The president of Tunisia visits his counterpart in Algeria. Monsef Marzouki, the dissident, once imprisoned for opposing Tunisian dictator Zain al-Abedin bin Ali, has replaced him as elected leader and will host the first Maghreb summit in 18 years. The Yemeni people brought about the departure of the fourth Arab dictator in the last year when demonstrations convinced Ali Abdullah Saleh to step down after 33 years. There was only one name on the ballot for Saleh's successor, his vice president. But still, a small step towards democracy. As in Libya, the transition to democracy is a struggle. But like these fishermen, many people are enjoying new freedoms, such as in how they make a living. Their plans to build a tourism industry on Libya's long neglected antiquity sites. Contrast that with Syria where the Assad regime promises a new constitution that would end his party's monopoly on power, but brutally cracks down on a popular uprising that began almost a year ago. The Arab Spring has met with violent resistance in the Gulf state of Bahrain, too, where pro-democracy demonstrators are again clashing with security forces determined not to allow Cairo's Tahrir Square to be replicated there. And in Tahrir Square itself, some of the Egyptians who gathered this January to mark the first anniversary of the historic revolution were still protesting, frustrated that so little has changed after such high expectations. What happened in January 2011 was really a popular revolution. Still, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces has made us feel that the revolution has ended up as a military coup since they took over. There have been no real changes to the old regime that we revolted against. We did not expect much from the SCAF, but we also never expected that one year later we would be back at where we were before Mubarak stepped down. In 2005, the Egyptian people for the first time had a choice of more than one name on a presidential ballot. Ayman Noor, parliament's youngest member, was considered the most outspoken candidate opposing President Hosni Mubarak. Mubarak and his National Democratic Party had run Egypt since 1981, so it came as no surprise that he won again easily with 88% of the vote. Ayman Noor then spent five years in prison on charges of falsifying party documents. His experiences have not diminished his determination to speak out. We talked to him from Cairo. One year after the revolution, if we say that there are four legal mechanisms of transition to democracy, uh, have any of these mechanisms been implemented, as far as you know? We pay a new price every day with more bloodshed to preserve our revolution. An average of about 10 people are getting killed every day. In the years since the revolution, our judiciary and other sovereign institutions are still run and staffed with the same people and with the same corruption that we suffered from for decades. 
There is no serious change whatsoever, and we believe that justice should be the top priority because it will provide retribution for the victims and will prevent more killings of the Egyptians. Justice will also lead to a real just trial of former officials who are responsible for the abuses under the old regime. What, in your view, would take for Egypt? What would it take for Egypt to emerge as a fully functioning democracy, to move to civil society or the transfer of power from the military council to an elected president? The three concepts are interrelated. First of all, it's essential that power be passed from the military to a transitional authority that then paves the way to the presidential elections. The current environment is not conducive to holding elections under the military's control, since it seems to want a really tight grip on the presidency. Furthermore, I believe we must have constitutional rules that guide the election process, different from those currently imposed on us by the SCAF. تنظم عملية الانتخابات خلافا للقواعد التي يريد المجلس العسكري أن يفرضها علينا. Last November, tens of thousands of Egyptians poured into Tahrir Square to protest the continued hold on power of the military council. At an anniversary demonstration this January, a likeness of Mubarak morphs into one of Field Marshal Tantawi, commander of Egypt's armed forces. Egyptian-born Mona El Tahawi was assaulted by security police at a Cairo demonstration last November. She says it's almost poetic that they broke the arms of a writer. In an interview with Perspectives Arash Azizadeh, Mona El Tahawi says Egypt faces more of the old regime, not less. I say that we replaced one Hosni Mubarak with 19 Hosni Mubaraks, basically the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, because they're all generals who rose through the ranks of the military with him. The head of the Supreme Council is Field Marshal Tantawi, who used to be Mubarak's defense minister. It's ignored the revolution's demands. One of the main demands of the revolution is civilian leadership for Egypt. SCAF said that they would hand over power to a civilian leadership within six months. It's been more than six months. So it, it's very important to understand that they are not the protectors of the revolution, as they keep saying. Rather, that they, are, they are, have hijacked the revolution, they're standing in the way of the revolution, and Egypt needs a civilian leadership immediately. Well, you mentioned, you know, brave, you know, going away from this old <coughs> style of, you know, regime that's been had. And you mentioned Papa, Papa style regime. Mm. So how, how does Egypt break away from that? For 30 years, Egypt has basically been put on pause. We can't fix those 30 years in the space of one year. So we have to understand to move away from that Papa figure, from the patriarch. Mubarak was just one patriarch. If you look at all the institutions in Egypt, they're all run by other patriarchs. We, we have a lot of work to do. But what gives me hope is that Egypt is a very young country, like the majority of countries in the Middle East. The majority of Egyptians are younger than 25. Current U.S.-Egyptian relations are founded on Anwar Sadat's decision to break his country's ties with the Soviet Union. Sadat's agreement to make peace with Israel in 1978 launched an aid agreement with the United States that continues to this day at around $2 billion per year. The bulk of that goes to Egypt's military. Uh, you have a new book out. Uh, Liberation Square. Ashraf Khalil has just published a book on the uprising of a year ago and the history of opposition that led to that revolt. He agrees that there is one similarity linking the countries of the Arab Spring. What could the United States do to support the democratic aspirations of Egyptians and what is uh, public opinion? How is it regarding the United States inside Egypt? I think public opinion towards the U.S. is not hostile, mm -hmm. but it is mistrustful. Mm -hmm. And I think I think Egyptians are right to mistrust the intentions of the United States. I think the word stability, I mean, if I never hear the word stability again, I'll, I'll be a happy man because so much unjustifiable policies have been, have been fostered under stability. Mubarak was the stability candidate. So you think the United States also had a role uh, in the, the in what happened in the Middle East, not as far as the protests are concerned, but to keeping the, sweat, the status quo going. I think the United States absolutely helped keep Mubarak in power. 
So anyone, anyone on the U.S. end that's, that's curious as to why Egyptians don't trust American intentions, the, the U.S. helped keep Mubarak in power. He was their stability candidate. Going forward, the U.S. needs to, A, keep a close eye on the government. I think the, the U.S.'s number one priority should be making sure that civil society in Egypt is allowed to flourish because it's not democracy is not just elections. It's what happens in between the elections. And right now we're seeing a crackdown on both foreign non-governmental organizations and crucially on local non-governmental organizations. The President of the United States. In 2009, when President Obama went to Cairo to give his new beginning speech to the Muslim world, he insisted that representatives of the Muslim Brotherhood be invited to attend. America respects the right of all peaceful and law-abiding voices to be heard around the world, even if we disagree with them. And we will welcome all elected peaceful governments, provided they govern with respect for all their people. Egypt held its first free elections for parliament at the end of last year. The United States expressed support for the democratic process. But the results that gave the Muslim Brotherhood a clear majority has raised concern in the United States and elsewhere over what the Islamist influence will be on Egypt's foreign policy. Ashraf Khalil says the Brotherhood should not be prejudged. The Brotherhood, I genuinely do believe the Brotherhood has renounced violence decades ago. They've shown no uh, tendency towards violence. They have worked within the political system and worked to penetrate this, this heavily guarded political system for decades. You have to take them at their word on that. What is the feel? What is the mood in Egypt? How legitimate are they? And do you believe that uh, they have been reformed, that they could work within a democracy? I don't think their legitimacy can be questioned. They want an election. You can argue whether the timing of the election was fair in that, that you know, they were sort of pushing the whole process to move as fast as possible so where, where their built-in decades-old infrastructure would have an advantage over these newer political forces, many parties that just formed in the wake of the revolution. But I've heard a uh, secular liberal, for lack of a better term, uh, politicians in Egypt say, you know what, another year really wouldn't have made that much of a difference for us. We need five years to get our act together and we can't not have elections for five years. That's not democratic. So I think their right to be in the parliament should not be questioned. From a Western perspective, I think we need to stick to the principles of democracy. They won an election. I mean, we've seen this in other places where Islamist forces have won elections and it was just an inconvenient result. We saw it in Algeria years ago. Frankly, we saw it in Gaza with Hamas. Nobody, nobody questioned the legitimacy of that election. They just didn't like the result, and so they ignored it. And that, that was probably not a good decision, strategically or morally. So we have to let them govern. Ayman Noor sees the election results as less a measure of the Muslim Brotherhood's popularity than on the lack of democratic infrastructure in his country. Obviously, all the parliaments that emerged after revolutions in many countries around the world reflected the shortcomings of the pre-revolution political environments more than reflecting the revolution itself. So I don't see this Egyptian parliament as reflecting the general political mood in the country, even if it is the result of elections that were not rigged which is a good development. But the elections were not fair either, since there was no real representation of a lot of the political forces for a variety of reasons, including the short time that was available for campaigning. Mona El Tahawi says the Egyptians themselves will be the judges of the Muslim Brotherhood. As long as they provide the kind of services that they promised their, their constituents, then, you know, they should stay in power. If, however, the Muslim Brotherhood have promised a whole bunch of things and are not able to deliver on these things and are not able to act as politicians, because now it's time to move away from ideology. It's time now to be a pragmatic politician because you're not, you're not giving a sermon anymore. You're actually running a country or you're, you're acting like a parliamentarian. If they fail to provide the things that they promised the people who voted for them, then four or five years from now for the next election, vote them out. What can Egypt do to assure both an Islamic you know, form of government or mm. an Islamic uh, government that is controlling everything and assuring secular and other religions mm -hmm. uh, to be 
fairly represented as well and also have their rights protected. Mm -hmm. You know, something very interesting happened uh, soon after the elections in Egypt ended, and that was Al-Azhar, which is basically the Sunni Muslim um, base uh, institution that trains clerics for Sunni Muslims around the world. It came out and it said, we need a Bill of Rights in Egypt. And that Bill of Rights is basically the best way to guarantee everybody's rights. Because something here that we're familiar with in the US is this idea that we don't want a tyranny of the majority. There is now concern and even anger in Washington over the decision by Egyptian authorities to shut down American and Egyptian pro-democracy groups and arrest their staffs. The powerful head of the Senate Appropriations Committee says that these actions are unjustified and violate the conditions for U.S. aid to Egypt. These terms include the protection of freedom of expression, association and religion, and due process of law. Senator Patrick Leahy says there will be no payments until the pro-democracy workers are released. We want to send a clear message to the Egyptian military, he says, that the days of blank checks are over. VOA's Mohammad Ashinawi spoke with Senator Leahy. Well, I think we've done the right thing. We said, look, the aid is there. It's ready to go. But you're going to have to at least comply with basic ideas of openness and, and democracy, uh, something that they'd already agreed to before the aid was gone. I think American people are not going to support aid to Egypt or any other country unwilling to do that. I'm not trying to tell Egypt this is exactly the kind of government you have to have, but I, what I am saying is you ought to uh, at least be open in your laws and you ought to be open in your dealings and you cannot step on the uh, human rights of your own people. Uh, President of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Dr. Mohammed Morsi, said if the United States would cut the aid, then Egypt would reconsider Camp David Accords since the aid was an integral part of that treaty. Now, I remember at the time the Camp David Accords were, were uh, written, I talked with then uh, uh, President Sadat and I talked with Prime Minister Begin. They signed those accords not for the aid, they signed it because they felt it was in the best interest of both countries. And it's worked well for both countries. I expect both countries to keep their word. Certainly the United States has an interest in helping Egypt. We have spent tens of billions of dollars to help Egypt. I mean, no, name a country that has done more to help Egypt than the United States. It's hard to, it's hard to think of one. What's your vision of U.S.-Egyptian relations in post-revolution Egypt that's influenced by public opinion compared to 30 years of relying on one man to keep that kind of relationship? That's more well, you know, I don't, I don't expect uh, Egypt to be just speaking with just one voice. I think you're going to have voices from the right to the left heard in Egypt, and that actually be better for Egypt seem concerned or frightened about how things are changing, go back to the promises made at the time of the overthrow, fulfill the promises. Doesn't mean everybody's going to have a, all the privileges they might have had before, but you're going to have uh, Egyptian people with a far better life than they now have, uh, where there's going to be more opportunity for everybody, not just a, a uh, favored few. But you're not worried about the future of the strategic cooperation with Egypt. What I want Egypt to be, and to continue to be, a stabilizing factor in that part of the world. Other countries have. Jordan has, and others have. I want uh, Egypt to be that way. I look at Tunisia, which has gone to uh, major changes. Libya, with obvious changes. There's going to be some rough times they go forward, but I would hope that they would come out as stronger, more democratic nations, one where the voices of all people are heard. Ayman Noor told me the United States should not threaten to cut aid to Egypt because he thought that would widen the gap between the two people when the Egyptians were in such an economic crisis. We ask all of our guests to tell us their visions for the future of Egypt. Here's what they said. I we're witnessing a new era, a new Arab world in which values of freedom and justice will prevail. The coming years will be a time of reason as the Arab peoples focus on economic development, cooperation and peace.
I believe we are entering an era of peace in the Middle East. We should not fear more conservative groups that are emerging, because the Arab peoples are now the deciders and will have the decisive word. Egypt and the rest of the Arab world should move toward building strong and correct relations with all countries in the region, based on just peace and common human and civilized values. The future under freedom and democracy will be far better than the long, painful years we spent under military regimes that use crises and military conflicts to justify staying in power. Now, we do not need such justifications because we are relying on the people's will and choices. There was tremendous unity of purpose during the revolution. Remarkable, really, considering what a diverse and, and disparate group of, of ideological groupings, uh, socioeconomic groupings, political groupings, and, and really, and, and, I, and I think that's a testament to how bad the Mubarak regime ran things in the last 15 years, in that, that it was able to bring together all of these people around a common goal of, you have to go. The place has been badly run and warped long before Mubarak. Mubarak's not the first military dictator in Egypt. You know, we're, we're, we're 60 years into this. It's going to take a long time. Egyptians have to learn how to operate within a democracy, not just the Islamists, the, the, the seculars and the liberals, etc. They're not very good at, at coming to compromises either. I'm actually okay with almost anything that happens in the next five years, as long as there's another election in five years, a real one. You know, it's very interesting for me that people outside of Egypt are so pessimistic. But when I return to Egypt and I talk to people who, you know, who've been beaten up, who've been tortured, who've been in jail, some people have lost eyes, you know, because they've been targeted, they've lost their eyesight um, because of violence from the security forces. They remain really optimistic. And the reason that we're all optimistic is because there's been this amazing awakening in Egypt. We are saying no in the loudest form that we have in a very long time. So that street will continue to pressure parliament, to pressure the military, to pressure anybody in Egypt to ensure that more revolutionary demands are met. And, you know, the revolution continues. It will not stop until the demands are met and there are many more demands that we have to fight for. We leave you where we started our program with a closing look at the news from Yemen. The outcome of the election is preordained, but that didn't stop people in Sana'a from turning out in force to choose their first new president in nearly 34 years. Pride in the success of last year's popular uprising seemed to counter any resentment that only one name was on the ballot, that of Vice President Abdrabu Mansour Hadi. A worker in Sana'a's old city says the uprising marked the real change. With regards to the Yemeni people, they have said what they want and expressed themselves prior to the event. Polling places in Sana'a appeared to be handling the crowds. Election observer Ali al Qainai was monitoring the vote in central Sana'a. I think it is a good turnout. A lot of people, I see people that are happy. They want to take part in these elections, particularly the women. I say big turnout uh, of women, and that's good. Women played a large role in the uprising, but Yemen's revolution remains largely unfinished, with a shattered economy, tribal and military divides, and an expanding al-Qaeda presence hampering true political change. Despite the challenges, some say the way President Saleh's era ended has offered a sense of hope. Yemen scholar Stephen Steinbeiser. The fact that he has actually left power and left the country relatively peacefully compared to some of the other revolutions that we've seen in the region is a major triumph for uh, the Yemeni democratic political processes. And for many, that's more than enough to celebrate for now. And in Syria, from the ancient city of Aleppo. Aleppo is a major port, close to Turkey. It's Syria's economic center. Here, the business elite support the government of President Bashar al-Assad. We trust that he will going to do some good stuff to this country and to the people. He likes his people. Many in Aleppo show their love for Mr. Assad at pro-government rallies. But across town, a different scene. Anti-government protests at Aleppo University, Syria's second largest institute of higher learning. Gray uniform security forces monitor the campus and break up the protests, but more demonstrations erupt elsewhere. Sasha Go Simonov attended Aleppo University and now lives in the U.S. 
in terms of the students, they're just stubborn and they go out from their schools, whether it's like the uh, Department of Arts and Sciences or on their, they have a residential campus they all live in and they can still organize and coordinate. In the city, Aleppo residents complain about blackouts and scarce fuel for their homes and cars. This man says he feels trapped in his home. We spoke with him via Skype. You can't trust anybody at all at streets in Aleppo or any other city in, in, in Syria. The Syrian violence is in its 11th month with no sign of it ending. Many people say the turning point could be here in the government stronghold of Aleppo. Our contact via Skype has this to say. If the regime falls or the revolution wins, it doesn't matter for me. What I mean, what I need is the peace to go in the street without any restriction. But for now, most Syrians have little peace. That wraps up this edition of Perspectives. Thank you for joining us. Next week, we'll talk to Dennis Ross. Goodbye. This is a voice speaking from America. On time is news and information. Core values. Objective. Honest. What it means to be free. If I heard it on the Voice of America, I could not but believe it. This is the voice of America. There are two guys going down the Red Square in Moscow and one of them is making and the other asks, what are you doing? He said, I'm jamming Voice of America inside me. January 27, 1926, Scottish inventor John Baird presented the first successful public demonstration of television. I have been working as a radio MC, radio producer, television anchor, reporter, editor, video journalist. When we originate content, we are originally for radio, TV, and internet. Uh, during my service in the United States at Congress, uh, I took the initiative in creating the internet. The voanews.com website uh, became one of the top 10 internet destinations uh, on Google. We have evolved as an organization. I personally uh, never look to the past and say those were our best days or best years. No, I'm looking to the future. Yeah, we are all in one.